Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. members this week, to Harriet Watson, who has introduced Julie Feely, Richard Tracy for introducing Amoy Williamson, Ishmael Cooper for introducing Catherine McCauley-Watt, Rosalind Th Sutherland for introducing Virginia Tilden, the rest of her names dropped off the page, I'm terribly sorry, and to Martha Schrader for introducing Tim Bernasek. <coughs> Welcome to all of you. Next Friday, March the 16th, join us for a special program featuring Dr. Robert Pamplin, founder of the Portland Tribune. He'll be talking about his goals for Portland's new newspaper and how he made Portland a two-newspaper town once again. That'll be here at the MAC. A reminder that the City Club website offers access to research reports, past club program presentations, upcoming events, and membership information. Check us out at www.pdxcityclub.org. Check the bulletin for details of our second Portland seminar series that will begin on March the 20th with Professor Carl Abbott. If you're interested, register today while there's still room. Places are limited and it's filling up fast. Our board host today is Andy Linehan, member of the Board of Governors and senior environmental planner with CH2M Hill. He will ask the first question of our speaker. Following Andy's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Don't be reticent, please be ready at the microphone before Andy has finished so that we have time for as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a member of the City Club and as always, dread warning, make your questions concise. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Kaiser Permanente Health System, Wells Fargo Bank and Portland General Electric. We're most grateful for their support. And now to our speaker. Jim Likatoich's book, Salmon Without Rivers, has been described as the handbook on salmon for the next century. So how did an ex-marine from Indiana find his way to Oregon State by way of a degree in fisheries science at Purdue? And how did he come to gain such a broad perspective on sustainable salmon fisheries in the Northwest? Since 1990, Jim has had his own company, Alder Fork Consulting, in Columbia City, Oregon. The list of his public and private clients bear witness to the esteem in which he's held. Oregon Business Council, NIMFS, Ecotrust, PGE, the State of Oregon, and others. Jim serves on three public boards that evaluate the Oregon plan for salmon and watersheds. On the Northwest Power Planning Council's Fish and Wildlife Program, he also has oversight of the Columbia River Fish and Wildlife Services for the wildlife plan and of the wildlife plan for NIMFS and the Northwest Power Planning Council. Jim's past professional positions include scientist and fisheries biologist with Mobran Biometrics, one of the tribes, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, leaving, I might say, as Assistant Chief of Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Battelle Pacific Northwest Labs. Now, I want to know how someone who's in so much demand all over the Northwest is able to live in bucolic isolation on Jimmy Come Lately Creek, buried in the woods somewhere beyond Squim. La <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Likatoich. Thank you, Patty, and, and thanks to the City Club for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today on my favorite subject, the uh, Pacific Salmon. In the next uh, 25 or 30 minutes, I'm going to cover three topics. What does it mean when we call the salmon the icon of the Northwest? How did this icon of the Northwest end up on the endangered species list? And what can we do about it? At least what can we do in terms of things that aren't being done that need to be done or things that aren't being adequately done? There's been so much attention focused on the Pacific salmon uh, in the last 10 years since the first listings that I think it's appropriate every once in a while to sort of step back and ask just who are these animals that 
are now the center of the major public policy debate in the Pacific Northwest, a debate having to do with energy supplies, debates having to do with uh, dismantling of uh, another icon of the Northwest, the, the great main stem hydroelectric dams. Just who are these animals that uh, the region in the year 2000 was willing to spend a billion dollars trying to bring back from the brink of extinction? spent a billion dollars in the year 2000, and, and every indication is we're going to end up spending a lot more in this year and on into the future. Well, five years ago when I started writing this book, uh, I thought I knew the answers to some of those questions. I was a biologist. I'd been working with salmon for most of uh, 25 years, and I knew something about their biology. I knew something about their life history. Um, but it wasn't until in writing this book that I was forced to study the geologic history of the Pacific Northwest and superimpose on that the 10 to 12,000 year history of human habitation in the Northwest and then add to that the evolutionary history of the salmon that I really began to appreciate just what these animals are. And if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read one short paragraph out of the book because I think it summarizes, at least in my mind, it summarizes uh, what I mean when I say that the salmon are an icon of the Northwest. It's actually, it's in the first paragraph, or first chapter of the book, but it's actually the la very last paragraph that I wrote before sending the book off to the publisher. My study of the evolutionary history of the salmon and the geologic history of the Pacific Northwest changed what I see when I look at a salmon. Now I see more than a silver fish sitting at the center of a regional crisis. Instead, when I look at a salmon today, I'm reminded of the region's long history. The large ocean-fed salmon remind, recalls the cooling of the sea 10 million years ago. How the rise of mountains and the advance of ice shaped the salmon's ability to colonize new habitat. How the diversity of the salmon's life history matches the highly variable landscape, climate, and vegetation patterns in the Northwest. I see, too, the physical beauty of the land, the old growth forests that protect and nurture the salmon's habitat, the wild and free rivers that flow through those forests, the mountains that contribute gravel for the salmon to spawn in, and the cool, drippy climate that keeps the rivers flowing. And finally, the salmon remind me of people, the Indian fishermen and their 10,000-year relationship with the salmon, the commercial fishermen and their unique communities and ways of life, and the sport fishermen who come from all over the Northwest to hunt the salmon. When I look at a salmon, I don't just see a silver fish. I see the entire Northwest. And at least from my perspective, that's what it means when I say that the salmon are an icon of the Northwest. Well, how did this icon end up on the endangered species list? The story of the salmon's problem is, is fairly complicated, and it's complicated because it involves nearly every activity that we engage in in our watersheds, from, from the headwaters on out to the main stem, through the estuary, and even out into the Pacific Ocean. It's a complicated problem, but it has very simple roots, and it's those simple roots that I want to talk about today. The salmon's problem is not what many suspect, primarily a story of greed, power politics, and mismanagement, although those do play a role. The salmon's problem at its root is a story of successfully pursuing a false vision for the salmon and their rivers. The collapse of the salmon is a consequence of that success. I'll return to that point uh, in a couple minutes. Pinpointing the beginning of the salmon crisis is very easy. It goes back to 1875 in a report prepared by the U.S. Fish Commission, a precursor to the National Marine Fishery Service. Now, by 1875, the salmon canning industry was 10 years old, and in that 10-year period, the economic value of the industry had grown a hundredfold. Business leaders, political leaders, recognized that the salmon industry was going to be a major contributor to the economics of the Pacific Northwest. So they began to worry about maintaining the supply of fish. 
And so they petitioned the U.S. Fish Commission. At that time, there were no state fish and wildlife uh, agencies to go to. So they petitioned the federal U.S. Fish Commission and asked two questions. What's going to cause the decline of salmon, and what can we do about it? Spencer Baird, the U.S. Fish Commissioner, responded in 1875 with a report that I think is probably the most significant document in this whole sad history of our relationship with the Pacific salmon. Spencer Baird said there were three things that were going to cause the decline of salmon. Dams, overharvest, and habitat change. Let me repeat those. Uh, dams, overharvest, and habitat change. The causes of the salmon's decline haven't changed in 126 years, but having, having possession of that knowledge, we were still unable to prevent it from occurring. And it wasn't that we didn't care about it. We did. The uh, government established uh, fish and wildlife agencies. They armed the agency with statutes. They funded programs throughout the last hundred years to, to protect the salmon, to bring about recovery. So it wasn't that we wanted them to, to uh, go into decline. We didn't. We knew what was going to cause the decline on top of it, and still we couldn't prevent it. And the obvious question is why? And the answer to that question is also in Spencer Baird's report. Spencer Baird said that for an investment of $20,000, we could make salmon, in artificial propagation, we could make salmon so abundant that you wouldn't have to worry about other problems. Now, in 1875, Spencer Baird had no scientific evidence to back up his recommendation. The first salmon hatchery had been opened in 1872, just three years earlier. The, the, most of the fish were still in the ocean when he made his recommendation. Yet his recommendation was accepted with few reservations. In fact, it was accepted so enthusiastically that we didn't even bother to evaluate whether it was achieving its results for another 70 years. In the meantime, habitat was destroyed, the runs were over-harvested, and dams were built. We bet the farm on hatcheries, and then we didn't even bother to determine whether we were winning or losing the bet. With the coming of the Endangered Species Act and the listing of Pacific salmon, it's become clear what the outcome of that bet was. You have to ask, how was this possible? Salmon were not just a charismatic species that we wanted to save and put on the shelf to look at. They were an important economic asset to the region. And, it, and so it's, it was real puzzling to me how we, would, how we would place so much faith in the technology, a technology that was supposed to maintain this, this economic asset, and then not bother to, not bother to determine whether or not it was meeting its promise. I didn't find the answer to that question in any biological text. I found it in a book written by a physicist, a person who had, uh, has a lot of faith in technology, Freeman Dyson. Freeman's a physicist that uh, was part of the team that was trying to develop a huge spaceship to send colonizers off into space, a spaceship that would have been powered by exploding nuclear, small nuclear reactions, nuclear bombs. So it wasn't, it's not that uh, Freeman is, is an anti-technologist, but he, but he did say you have to beware of technology that's derived from ideology and not science. Because in ideologically derived technology, the signs of failure are ignored until great damage has been done. And that's exactly what happened. Signs of failure were ignored. Signs of failure in this reliance on artificial propagation were ignored until great damage had been done. They were accepted, as I said, not because there was a strong scientific basis. They were accepted because they fit very well with the laissez-faire ideology that was present in the late 19th century. Uh, the ideology that said we ought to allow people to have access to resources uncontr unconstrained by government. Hatcheries made it possible to over-harvest, 
dam rivers, irrigate, cut riparian trees with little or no control or regulation. So while the salmon were in decline during this period of time, we ignored the, the results and continued to build and operate hatcheries with the false hope of recovering these great natural abundance of salmon, of, of not only maintaining or recovering the great natural abundance of salmon, but even making it more productive, producing more salmon than we're here naturally. But it wasn't until the late 1900s, or early 1900s, 1910, 1920, that we even began to conduct research on these animals to find out something about their basic biology and their basic life history patterns. We didn't even take time to learn about these animals that we felt sure we could replace by placing them out of the rivers and into hatcheries. That's how sure we were of our dream of a salmon without rivers. Research finally was initiated in the 20s and 30s, and that research began to bear fruit in the 1930s and the 1940s. We began to understand the salmon's life history and something about their basic biology. We, we began to understand the importance of maintaining the health of local habitats and maintaining local populations in those habitats, the populations that were adapted to those habitats. We resolved the debate in the late 1930s over whether salmon home back to their stream of birth or not. That debate was resolved in 1937 or 38. We also began to recognize limitations on hatcheries. From this new understanding, a new approach to management uh, was possible, and, and it was beginning to emerge, and in fact, in the management of the Fraser River, this new approach was adopted as part of their management program up there. But something else in the 1930s and 40s was happening down here. We were beginning, we were beginning to enter the era that was known as the big dam building era, the era from about the 1940s, late 1930s to the 1970s, when the large main stem dams were built in many rivers in the Pacific Northwest. Biologists literally had no idea how they were going to get fish over these dams. In the early years of planning for the dams, the experiments that were conducted to, to try to get fish over the dams in various ways were not successful. They were not very successful. So salmon management had come to a fork in the road. Uh, do we follow, follow the science that we had developed up to that time and, and change management accordingly, or do we stick with the status quo, given the, given the tremendous change in the habitat that was about to occur as the main stem dams were being built? Remember, at this time in the 1940s, hatcheries still hadn't shown that they could produce uh, viable uh, replacement for natural habitat or the production that we would have gotten from natural habitat. That didn't come until the 50s and 60s. But on the Columbia River, we chose the status quo. We chose to still use artificial propagation in an attempt to make up for the loss of habitat created by the main stem dams, even though hatcheries had not shown any strong success up to that time. Now, in the 1980s, biologists rediscovered the science that was emerging in the 30s and 40s. And it is now beginning to shape uh, our new management approaches. In many cases, the newer hatchery programs, the programs that have come online just recently within the last 10 or 15 years, are trying to incorporate the latest science into their, pro into their operations. But they're really large experiments at this stage, experiments that haven't played themselves out yet. And we need, to, we need to clearly distinguish between a bet and an experiment. In 1875 and in 1940, we bet the salmon resource that we could develop artificial propagation that would uh, replace it. And when you make a bet, you have to be willing to lose irreversibly what you're betting. And we did. 
we did. We lost a lot of salmon productivity and a lot of salmon habitat that we will never recover by making that bet. An experiment is something you do, you do enough of to ensure that you can gain insight and learn enough to make uh, appropriate decisions, but you don't do enough so that, so that if you find that you're wrong, you can't uh, recover, make it irreversible. So we need, to, we need to be careful to continue to experiment and not place any bets on the future. We don't have enough future left in the salmon to do that. The salmon's problem does have greed, waste, power politics, and poor management decisions. But in the end, it represents success. Success in pursuing a dream of simplifying and controlling salmon production. And we've been successful at that. In the Columbia River now, 80% of the salmon that come back to the river were produced as a result of hu human operations, human control through artificial propagation. So we've achieved Spencer Baird's dream, but we've paid a big price for it. And the salmon have paid a big price for it. Salmon were once one of the great biological wonders of North America. They ranked right up there with the passenger pigeon, the plains buffalo, and as we marched across the country, as we were, as we were taming the frontier and, and as the Euro-Americans were settling various parts of the country, those great biological wonders, mm -hmm. those great examples of the productivity that uh, North America has, were either extinguished or brought to extremely low numbers. And it appears as though salmon are bound to share the same fate. I think, I think when history looks back over, over the European settlement of, of uh, North America, however they're going to view the loss of the passenger pigeon and the plains buffaloes and the Great Lakes, white pine forest, when they get to the salmon, they're going to view, they're going to view it differently. And we are going to, this generation and maybe a couple previous generations, are going to, are going to be judged differently because I think history is going to look back and say they knew better. They absolutely knew better and couldn't change, couldn't change the fate of this uh, magnificent resource. Well, what can we do? There's lots of things that are being done to, uh, to bring about the recovery of salmon, and I'm only going to focus on a few that I think either aren't being done and need to be done or we're not doing enough of, and we should be doing more. Anybody that's looked at the history of the Pacific salmon resource understands that we've been writing recovery plans since the 1920s. And when you look at this whole series of recovery plans, the first thing you'd have to conclude is on paper, the salmon are the most recovered species in the world. <laughs> uh, but it's obviously that these recovery operations didn't work. And what that tells me is that it tells me that maybe the problem lies at a deeper level than we've been willing to admit so far in our efforts. And it means maybe that we need some major changes in the status quo if we're going to bring about salmon recovery. What are some of those changes that uh, need to be made? First one, I think salmon recovery efforts need to be inclusive rather than exclusive. And by that I mean we, we cannot go into watersheds, do meaningful things to bring about the recovery of salmon without affecting everything else that goes on in the watershed. We have to learn that lesson. We have to learn that, that the salmon's penetration into the Northwest is too pervasive and too strong to separate restoration of salmon from all the other activities that go on in the watershed. A year ago, last February, Governor Kitzhopper gave a speech to the American Fishery Society, and, and the media tagged it as a dam breaching speech. And I think the media got the message wrong. I, I didn't hear the speech, I read it. And the speech was not about dam breaching, although that was mentioned in the speech. The speech was about developing an inclusive approach to salmon recovery. It was about going into a watershed and taking into consideration all of the activities that affect salmon 
and that will be affected by salmon recovery efforts, and honestly talking about the trade-offs that have to be made if we're going to recover these animals. And I think that's what the inclusive approach to salmon recovery is, and I agree 100% with uh, Kitzhaber's approach. Recovery activities need to be implemented at the watershed scale. The great salmon biologist W.F. Thompson described the salmon's life history as a chain of places, chain of places that the salmon have to be able to get to at the right time of the year in order to carry out their important life functions of spawning, rearing, migrating, and so on. The, the use of the image of a chain is, I think, very appropriate because when you have a chain, and some biologists have estimated that there are as many as maybe seven to 11 unique links, these habitat links in the salmon's life history chain as they move through the watershed out to the ocean and back again. So if you have a chain that has 10 or 12 links in it and four of them are broken, and you fix two of them, even with very heroic efforts, you fix two of those links, you still have a broken chain. And if the broken chain represents some kind of a living system, you have a system that's not going to survive. That helps explain, uh, to some degree, the, the way that we can spend an awful lot of money on salmon recovery and sometimes get very little out of it. We're very busy, very good, working in watersheds, fixing links in the chain. We're not stepping back. We're not taking an account of the whole watershed, the whole salmon life history habitat relationship. We're not fixing the entire chain. We're fixing links. And we need to, we need to step back. We need to take the whole watershed approach. There is, there is effort along this line that's uh, being implemented. Um, I think the council is honestly trying to incorporate an entire watershed approach to some of their activities. Um, there is a tendency, the status quo, though, to stick with the individual project, individual link fixing approach, and it's uh, going to be interesting to see if the council can overcome that inertia. We need to reduce management fragmentation. We have, to do, we have to reduce management fragmentation if we're going to have any hope of taking an entire watershed approach to, to management. And by management fragmentation, I mean within a watershed, the resources of the watershed are often managed by several different uh, agencies and institutions, each having a different piece of responsibility and sometimes each having missions that are... are uh, conflict with each other. That's fragmentation of the management of the watershed. This has been a problem that's been recognized for about a hundred years. The first person to talk about management fragmentation in the Columbia Basin was Teddy Roosevelt in his State of the Union address in 1908, when he, in his way, said, uh, if the states of Oregon and Washington, and he was just talking about fragmentation among two states. If the states of Oregon and Washington couldn't get together and manage the salmon effectively, he would federalize salmon management and not let the salmon go extinct. Um, it didn't happen right away, but eventually uh, salmon management did largely become a federal operation and in order to prevent uh, them from going extinct. In the 1930s and 1940s, the Oregon State Planning Board, a government, I, th I believe it was a government agency back then, and the uh, Washington State Senate both looked into salmon problems, and they both concluded that we had to simplify management. We had to reduce management fragmentation. The Washington State Senate went so far as to say that we're going to be hopelessly stymied from, from uh, recovering salmon in the Columbia River until we simplify management. That was in 1940. The only thing that's happened in the ensuing, since 1908, is management has gotten more and more and more fragmented. We cannot take whole watershed approaches to 
to uh, recovery until we, we can't get rid of all the management fragmentation, but we can sure begin to tackle it and reduce it somewhat. We need to place emphasis on recovery of natural production. One of the, one of the problems inherent in uh, Spencer Baird's recommendation is that it, it generated a very simple management model of hatcheries supplying fish to fisheries and fisheries being regulated to get enough fish back to hatcheries which continued the, the cycle. And it, was, and it was operated as though this could be a closed system, very stable, predictable, closed system. The problem with natural systems is they, they tend to leak a lot. And, and this one leaked, and things like ocean conditions changed, droughts had a tendency to disrupt this simple system, and the fact that hatcheries just weren't producing the results that they were supposed to disrupted the system. But the simple, that simple harvest hatchery model was the basis for management for a long time. And I, and I would say that the, the ghosts of that management system are still present. In the management agencies, harvest and hatcheries are the dominant policy arms, policy formulating arms. And that needs to change. We need, we need to focus on natural production. We are not going to harvest or artificially produce our way out of the endangered species crisis. We're only going to get out of the endangered species crisis by improving the health of our watersheds and allowing that health of our watersheds to increase natural production of salmon. That will require a uh, change in the funding of fish management agencies. Uh, most of the funding now comes through harvest and hatchery, so there's going to be a strong reluctance to change. We need to decouple funding from those two sources and allow the institutions to change so they can reorient and focus on watershed health and improving natural production. And I'm, according to my watch, I'm right on a half hour, so I'll stop at that point. And by uh, the many faces in the audience that I recognize, I'm sure there's not going to be a, a lack of interesting questions coming up. Thank you for what was a very enlightening but rather sobering presentation. Um, I was struck by a couple themes in what you said. Uh, you talked about looking at the watershed scale for restoration and also at the challenges of fragmented uh, management of salmon recovery. Over the last uh, two or three decades, a lot of the focus has been on the main stem dams. And the main stem dams, of course, are, are operated by just a handful of agencies, BPA, the Corps, et cetera. That has had the advantage of allowing a lot of focus to be placed on the key entities which control the dams. As we move to a watershed type of restoration program, we're talking about a dispersal of, of decision making among thousands of landowners, many, many agencies. The, the cast of characters gets much larger rather than more, more coordinated. Uh, how can we address the challenge of trying to be more comprehensive and yet being less fragmented on an institutional scale, I should say? Well, if you read the, uh, the Federal Caucus report, um, the report that basically described the alternative actions that would be taken to, uh, as, uh, instead of uh, considering dam breaching, uh, in that report, uh, sort of unwritten in the report, is the implication that that, that, that level of cooperation and that level of uh, reduction in fragmentation is going to occur somehow without really explaining how it's going to occur. I'm a, I'm a, a fishery biologist. I'm not a uh, political scientist and I'm not a, a politician. And I think those kinds of problems, the, the fragmentation of responsibility among agencies uh, and the, uh, 
the need to get what agencies you have to cooperate uh, so that we can take whole watershed uh, approaches are the responsibility, I believe, of our political leaders. And, um, and th that's, that's not the kind of, that's not the kind of uh, decisions or the kinds of uh, recommendations that a biologist can make, I guess other than to point out that, that, that that's a problem and it's impeding uh, recovery efforts. Thanks. Mike Houck, City Club member, uh, Patty pointed out the great esteem the Northwest holds you in for, for your, your views and your contribution to salmon recovery. Um, um, that's precisely why I want to ask the question I'm going to. I noticed that Bill Bakke, um, another champion for salmon with native fish societies in the audience, and he has waxed eloquent about the importance of having grown up in the Columbia Slough watershed in north and northeast Portland and what impact that had on his life. And my concern is I've heard lots of lawyers in particular and consultants representing clients who do not want to do a lot of things you say we need to do, invoking your name um, to make the argument that urban waterways, which are degraded Fannel Creek, Johnson Creek, the main stem of the Willamette, in Portland Harbor should be written off and not considered seriously in, as part of the equation. And I was just wondering if you would care to comment on that, if that accurately represents your viewpoint, which I really sincerely doubt if we're talking about full <laughs> watershed. Um, so it's, it's kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, well, can I give you a rhetorical <laughs> answer? <laughs> um, I've heard that, and uh, it's amazing when a book comes out how uh, many people like to invoke your name. I, I know even John invokes my name a lot uh, in ways that, that maybe I wouldn't agree all the time. But um, the, uh, the fact is, when it comes to whether or not we make the choice between recovering urban streams or putting the money, say, into the upper part of the watershed, uh, has to do let me run through about four or five different uh, aspects of this, and I'll try to keep my thoughts organized and logical. First of all, uh, one of the big mistakes we make in salmon recovery, uh, and we make it over and over and over again, is that we begin arguing about strategies before we've decided what our goals are, what we're trying to accomplish. And when I talk to groups, I always tell them, you, you've got to lay out what your goals are. You've got to understand what your goals are. And you've got to make those goals compatible with the goals of everything else in the watershed, the logging, the irrigating, everything else. And then, once you've come up with a set of goals, then worry about strategies to, to accomplish those goals. And everybody always says, yeah, we understand that we've got to do that. But can't you just give us a list of things we can go out and do right now? And you want to try to avoid the debate over what you're going to do before you know what it is you're going to try to accomplish with the things you're going to do. But having said that, I think there is an awful lot of value in keeping the salmon and the people close together. I think there's a, a lot of reason why we wouldn't want to isolate the salmon 100 or 150 miles from the city where most people would not ever see them and wouldn't be able to identify with them and wouldn't, wouldn't feel directly connected to them. One of, the, one of the strongest things I see when I talk to various groups is the fact that it's not just salmon in the abstract that, that watershed councils and other groups are trying to work to save. It's, water, it's salmon in their backyard. It's the salmon that they see coming into their neighborhoods, whether it's on the south coast or southern Oregon or, or wherever. And so I think it's real important that, uh, that we try to keep that connection uh, every bit as much as we can. I'm, uh, I don't like triage. Uh, I like to think we can do everything. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm making those kinds of choices sort of, uh, sort of runs against my, uh, my personal uh, feelings, I guess. Um, I'd hate to write off a salmon population or, or a run or a stream until it was absolutely, absolutely necessary. The, uh, 
third or fourth thing, I lost count, um, is getting back to what W.F. Thompson said, that the salmon's life history is a chain of these favorable places. And if you're at the lower end of a river, um, even though you may be a big urban center and, and change is going to come awful hard, you may be sitting right on top of one of those links in that chain of favorable places. And fixing that link or not fixing that link may negate all the other stuff that goes on upstream. So you have to be careful and take that into account. And finally, I think making streams comfortable homes for salmon, whether they're urban streams or wilderness streams, are also going to provide, for those, provide in those streams for other values and other animals that uh, are also important. And we need to take that into account also when making this decision. But really, the first thing you've got to do is decide what are your goals. Do your, do your goals include neighborhoods where people and salmon are close together and where, where we finally, after 150 years of doing everything we can to destroy the relationship between humans and salmon, maybe it's time we, we tried in some of these neighborhoods to reestablish uh, a relationship between salmon in some kind of co-evolving way that allows uh, the salmon to survive in the, in the the humans to feel good about it. So does that answer your rhetorical question? <laughs> Hi, Jim. I'm Jane Cease, a City Club member. Um, as you probably know, we have a system um, of state-established watershed councils in Oregon. Um, I guess I could only describe them as um, uh, spotty, uh, underfunded, and in the city of Portland we've even had one area, one watershed, where we had two competing ones, one appointed by the city and one appointed by the county. Um, if, if we were to look at um, more coordinated watershed management of salmon recovery, um, what kinds of things I'm assuming we ought to start with a, a good plan, but what other kinds of things in terms of funding, management, authority, power, those kinds of things, what might uh, one look at in order to really um, do what needs to be done for salmon recovery in those habitats? Uh, I, th I, uh, I think the uh, Watershed Council concept was one of the uh, really big accomplishments of the uh, Oregon Salmon Plan. And it, but it is, has the same kinds of uh, recommendations that I made earlier about uh, needing to take a whole watershed approach. Um, I think, and I also, uh, I want to state that I, th I think as, as much as you can get salmon recovery and uh, salmon uh, awareness and salmon education at the local level through the watershed councils, as much as that, that can be done at that level, then the better off I think you are. Um, having said that, I think there needs to be some uh, overarching constraints that needs to be consistent with the best science. And, and the uh, councils need to be encouraged, the watershed councils need to be encouraged to, particularly on the w larger watersheds where there may be two or three watershed councils, to work together to be sure that they end up with a whole watershed approach. Um, the, danger, the danger, as I see it, is that uh, the proliferation of watershed councils, and I, I read somewhere there there's like 300 of them now in, in Oregon, California, and Washington, that that could just add to more fragmentation of uh, the work that's going on in, in watersheds and, and impede progress towards a, a whole watershed recovery approach. So that, that, I guess that's what I can say, just, just they need to be encouraged to take a whole watershed approach and they need guidelines to ensure that what they are doing are consistent with the latest science. 
but other than that, I think they really need to be encouraged to get out and, and do get close to the salmon and, and rekindle that relationship with the salmon because that's, that in the long run is, is going to bring about the recovery. I'm Thane Jensen, City Club member. Uh, John Platt wanted me to, to grill you, Mr. Likatowicz, about the, uh, the failure to mention tribal restoration efforts and the success they've had in the, uh, in the Columbia. But uh, I grew up in Astoria, a salmon-dependent community. I s I've remained connected to that community an awful lot and have worked on behalf of the commercial and recreational fishing community and environmental interests as well. And it seems to me that salmon recovery doesn't occur in a vacuum. You need sustained uh, and broad political support to accomplish that. And that means to me that you've got to have those folks that fish uh, for a living, whose livelihood depends on it, be they tribes, be they recreational or commercial fishers, an opportunity, at least in times of abundance, to fish. This year we've got record returns for spring salmon in the Columbia. We've got apparently 1.6 million uh, ocean uh, productivity index out there, a huge record uh, apparently return that we can expect here in the fall, most of which are hatchery fish. And if I understand your views, we really shouldn't be fishing on those. Uh, how can we sustain the political effort? Uh, if we can't do that when we have these kinds of record abundance. Um, you heard me say that we shouldn't fish on hatchery fish? Well, it, it was, uh, how, do, it was how do a, we maintain fisheries without utilizing the hatcheries here in the Columbia River? Region? Oh, I agree. I, and I, uh, I'm a firm believer in the fact that the uh, fishermen have borne the, the burden of salmon declines for over a century now. Uh, at a time when other, other entities in the watershed were being mildly inconvenienced at best, the fishermen were losing their livelihoods, both tribal fishermen and non-tribal fishermen, and that they have borne the, they've borne the, uh, the brunt of the, of the cost of salmon recovery. Uh, or the lack of salmon recovery. So to the extent, to the extent possible that uh, these fish can be harvested, they should be harvested. As long as, as, long as it's uh, consistent with sound conservation principles and we're not going to end up over harvesting wild populations um, in, the, in the course of trying to harvest the uh, hatchery populations. That was a major contributor to the declines of salmon uh, throughout many decades of this century, anyway, the overharvest of natural production uh, in trying to harvest uh, hatchery production. So, I've, I, and I have, in many of my talks, have said I, I feel just as badly when, when a local fishing community, whether it's a tribal community or a community down in Astoria, whether it's the fishermen that used to fish out of Chinook, Washington, um, when, they, when they go extinct, when they lose their livelihood, I just feel just as badly about that as I do about losing a stock of salmon in the upper part of the watershed or in another part of the watershed, because those fishing communities are part of our cultural heritage. They're part of our heritage every, every bit as much as the salmon are part of our heritage. The problem is, the problem is trying to figure out a way of keeping them healthy and at the same time trying to keep the uh, salmon healthy, the wild populations healthy. And that's a difficult balance, as John knows. Lennox Dick, City Club member. <coughs> Geneticists have come a long ways. In a recent Canadian Journal of Fisheries, there was an article that showed that if you take a wild fish, made it with a uh, hatchery fish, that the genes that come out are two-thirds wild fish and one-third hatchery fish. Now, we're stuck with hatcheries. We're never going to get away from hatcheries. But isn't it possible to use hatcheries and reverse the genetic train so that you end up having wild fish and hatcheries by uh, genetic manipulation? Uh, I haven't read that paper, unfortunately. It's, I can't tell you the year, but it's there. Yeah. Um, the whole question of uh, hatchery and wild and the genetic influences of uh, 
hatchery fish on wild fish and vice versa, and the, and the ultimate impact of that on uh, sustaining production has been the subject of uh, several workshops and symposia over the last uh, 15 or so years. I think I've been probably to eight, nine, ten of those symposia, and at every one of them, it always boils down to the same conclusion that we just don't know enough about those kinds of interactions, those kinds of impacts, to know how to effectively manage uh, the integration of hatchery and wild stocks. I think it's time that, uh, that we quit hiding behind not knowing enough and the, and the proper studies uh, be funded so that those questions can be answered and not answered once and for all because they're going to continue variations of them forever, but, but answered to the point where we can stop wasting a lot of energy arguing over hatchery versus wild and understand how we can integrate artificial and natural production in our watersheds. Whether or not you agree with the bet we made in 1875 and again in 1940, it's, it's not fruitful to go back and talk about it. We've traded, we've traded a lot of habitat uh, for hatcheries. The challenge now is to figure out how can we make those hatcheries work and how can they be productive and how can we integrate artificial and natural production so both of them are contributing healthily to uh, what goes on in a watershed. One shouldn't be dominating the other. I'm Ray Polani, a City Club member. I think I'm going to disappoint the audience by not asking a transportation <laughs> question. <laughs> Anyhow, having put that aside, uh, I imagine that you know about the uh, Northwest Catholic bishops entering yeah. the fray. Yeah with their uh, encyclical on the Columbia River. And there is plenty of concern there about uh, livelihood and consumption and population and attitudes and so on. But I recently, uh, I think two or three days later, read a letter to the editor in the Oregonian by somebody that said, wait a minute, Catholic bishops, they're not saying anything about one big problem, overpopulation. And would you care to comment? Um, I have, uh, you know, that uh, some of that was done through the University of Portland, and uh, I have a tie with the University of Portland. I, I went to a Catholic high school in South Bend, Indiana. And um, I just discovered that the, uh, the academic dean at the University of Portland was a fellow that I went through four years of high school with. Um, when we graduated, I joined the Marines, and he went into the seminary. And uh, we've just sort of got back together. And through him, I've kept in touch with and, and kept informed of what the uh, bish bishops have been doing, getting their newsletters and things. Um, when I read their, their newsletter, and I'm, I'm trying to recall specific language, and I can't, but it seems to me like threaded through that newsletter is, is uh, well, admittedly, it didn't, they, they didn't come out and explicitly say we have to limit population. But I, when I read through that, I, uh, I clearly got the message that uh, we have to take care of God's creation and, and trampling it with too many people is not, not the way to take care of it. Um, so maybe they were being diplomatic, uh, I don't know, but uh, I think that's all I can, <laughs> that's all I can say on it. Uh, Tom Dunn, I'm a member. You mentioned science, <clears throat> you're a scientist. Uh, could you uh, simply, if you could, 
uh, mention one or two of the top problems of salmon science that remain to be resolved. And if you could, I'd like to know who's working on them, too. Thank you. One of them I mentioned just a few minutes ago, and that is how do you integrate artificial and natural production in watersheds where part of the watershed was traded for, the habitat in the watershed was traded for hatcheries. How do you, how do you integrate artificial and natural production so that you get, uh, so that they both contribute to the uh, uh, ultimate production so that hatcheries are not replacing what, what, should, what we should be getting naturally from these uh, watersheds. That's, that's one problem. That's been a problem that's been around for a long time and I suspect it'll still be around for a while. Um, we don't know enough about uh, the life history habitat relationship of salmon we don't understand what all the links in this chain are and how, why those links are important and how the salmon use those links. One of the reasons why we had the great huge runs of salmon uh, that everybody talks about in the early part of this century and the late 19th century was because not all the salmon did the same thing at the same time at the same place. If they did, we would have had much we would have had a lot fewer fish. The, the, the reason why we had such huge productivity was that there were tremendous number of these chains, tremendous number of these pathways through the, through the uh, freshwater system, the estuarine system, and the ocean. So a given population, say a, a population in the Grand Ronde or, or the population in the Deschutes River, the fish may have may have used that watershed in the, in the lower river watershed in many different ways, many different types of life history chains. And we've eliminated many of those uh, in some of the changes in habitat that we've done. Um, but I think one of the keys to recovering salmon is to understand all those links in the chain and, and particularly understand those links that have disappeared because of uh, changes that we've made. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember, there was an article written in the Oregonian about three or four years ago in which uh, the, the author quoted me that we have to, we have to focus some attention on rec recovering the ghosts. We have to recover some of these life history habitat chains that have disappeared rather than trying to increase the numbers in already existing uh, pathways, because in some cases those pathways are already full, you can't add any more fish, but we could by diversifying the way the salmon use the uh, habitat. That would be mimicking how, how they were able to achieve their great productivity uh, through our restoration. So that understanding that is one area of research that I think is real important that's not, not getting a lot of attention. There's a few groups that are working on it. Uh, at OSU, um, I don't. I, I'm not familiar with anybody at the University of Washington that's working on it. Um, I can't give you any of the names. And probably 30 seconds after I walk out the door, I'll have a whole list of them. But uh, those are two, anyway. I'm Betsy Warren, our City Club member, and I'm going to speak as someone who doesn't know the science of salmon at all. In the paper, they were talking yesterday about uh, because of the drought that they're going to reduce or eliminate the spillways for salmon to get back to the sea. And my question is, if, if you truck little salmon around these dams, how do they find their way back? That's a good question. Um, they... Um, And I have to tell you, I'm not up on the uh, studies that looked at the straying of uh, fish as they were trucked. Um, and I know there was some straying that occurred. And I think uh, there's a lot of effort to try to minimize straying by recirculating water as the fish go downstream and, and some of those other, uh, doing some other things. 
but the fact is that that uh, that that the salmon have an intimate relationship with the river, even when they're migrating. For a long time, we've had this uh, kind of uh, image of the river as just a, a pipe that fish shot through on their way from, from the upper river to the ocean. And uh, they had no, no connection with the, with the pipe any more than any other thing would be. be it was just an inert uh, piece of metal. Uh, but the river is a living thing, and the, and the salmon are a living thing, and there was, a, there was an intimate relationship between the salmon and the river as they moved downstream. And barging disrupts that, and straying may just be one, one factor that gets disrupted. There's probably others that, we have no, that we're not aware of, we have no idea of that we're disrupting. Um, and, you know, I think we have to be careful. In, in years like this one coming up, uh, from what I've seen, it's probably going to be beneficial if we're not going to if we're not going to provide the flows to keep the salmon alive through the system naturally. Then it probably will provide some benefit to uh, to barge them. But barging isn't the solution to the to the salmon's problem, uh, particularly the the problem getting down downstream. This will be our last question. Uh, Nan Newell, City Club member. Um, my question's very short. Um, I love to eat salmon, but I also like to be an environmentally appropriate person. I was just wondering if you could tell us whether it's better to eat uh, farmed salmon or wild-caught salmon or not eat salmon at all right now. <laughs> um, whenever I go to the grocery store and buy salmon, I ask the, the grocer where he got the fish. And if he can't explain it to me, or if, I, if, if it sounds like he's trying to uh, tell me what I want to hear, then I won't buy it. Uh, and I think he should feel good about eating uh, all the hatchery salmon you can eat. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would be concerned about, uh, about wild fish, particularly wild fish that are caught in this area. And that's why I, Alaskan wild fish uh, there's still a lot of strong runs up there. And some grocers, it's amazing, they, they can tell you exactly where they got those fish from. Others don't have a clue. And I, uh, I just steer away from those. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>